where we're continuing our study of the book of Joshua tonight. We're going to begin in chapter 6. We're actually going to begin in Genesis chapter 15, but you don't have to turn over there. We're talking about the slides here. Just to set the backdrop for why we're doing what we're doing in the book of Joshua, if you're reading ahead, you've come to realize, I hope, that by the time you get to about chapter 9 or 10, the rest of the book just talks about the division of the land of Joshua, which tribe gets what, and all that kind of stuff, until you get to the last couple of chapters, maybe 22, 23, 24. And so we're not going to spend a lot of time on those chapters in the middle because there's not a whole lot there. And so I mentioned to John in an email today that uh, we probably have, counting tonight, three lessons left in Joshua, potentially four, depending upon how much time we spend doing some of the stuff we are doing. So be thinking about what we're going after Joshua because we'll be done with Joshua by the end of September for sure, I would think. So let's pray and we'll get started. God, we're thankful that you're with us tonight. We're thankful that we can be here in this study. We pray as we look at this Old Testament scripture, God, that you will reveal to us messages you want us to learn. Help us to be able to see in this book how we can better serve you and how we should be serving you. God, I just pray that your spirit guides us, help us to reach those conclusions that you want us to know. In Jesus' name, amen. So in Genesis chapter 15, we read this, which is again setting the stage for, uh, for Joshua. It says, as the sun was setting, Abram fell into a deep sleep, and a thick and dreadful darkness came over him. Then the Lord said to him, know for certain that for 400 years your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own and that they will be enslaved and mistreated there. But I will punish the nation they serve as slaves, and afterward they will come out with great possessions. You, however, will go to your ancestors in peace and be buried in a good old age. In the fourth generation, your descendants will come back here, for the sin of the Amorites has not yet reached its full measure. When the sun had set and darkness had fallen, a smoking firepot was blazed with a blazing torch, appeared and passed between the pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram and said, To your descendants I give this land, from the Wadi of Egypt to the great river, the Euphrates, to the land of the Kenites, Tenzites, Catamites, Hittites, Perezites, Raphaites, the Amorites, Canaanites, Gagashites, and Jebusites. So God has told Abraham hundreds and hundreds of years before, the land you're in now, at that time he was in, in the middle of what we would call Israel, this land's going to be given to you. You're going to take over all these nations who were there. And as we read through the book of Joshua, you find these names in the book as the Israelites conquer them and beat up on them and take over the land. So here's a map of the pre-conquest. And of course, some of you guys probably can't see it. That's where you'll see it. And again, I wish I had a laser that would show up on the TV screen or a pointer. But this is the land of Canaan. And here are all those different ites mentioned in there that we just saw in the book of Genesis. The Ammonites, the Aramites, Moabites, and then over here in the land of Canaan, the Philistia, Phoenicia, all these different Amalekites, different nations and different people who were in the land before the children of Israel uh, go in to make it. And so that's what it looked like as the children of Israel were getting ready to come across the land. So as we start the book, or we start this chapter, at least, where are the children of Israel when chapter 6 opens? Egypt. Jericho? Egypt. No, no, they're not in Egypt. Jericho. Yeah, they're outside of Jericho, right? If you remember, we crossed the, the river last night, crossed the Jordan River. And so they're on the west side now of the Jordan River next to Jericho. Camp somewhere close by. We don't know exactly so much where. No, 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 I'm sorry. No, no. We're in Joshua chapter 6. So we find them. They've crossed the river. God stopped the river. And I read something this week, just reading something else, that the Jordan River still occasionally gets blocked up. Because somewhere about where the Bible says the water stopped, there's apparently a lot of landslides. And landslides would fall into the Jordan River and stop its flow. And one time it was like 18 hours before the river started flowing again. 
to a backwater body that can push through the landslide. So they think, well, maybe that's what God caused to happen. It caused a landslide to block the water. But we know it's not an unusual occurrence occasionally uh, for that to happen. So they're on the west side, camped up against the river, getting ready to go over to take the land. God gives Joshua a battle plan for Jericho. What was the plan? And why do you think it was designed that way? Victor battles people in the ark and blow horn trumpets. Yep. And do what? Walk around the city one time every day for six days. Yep. And on the seventh day, seven times. Yep. And you blow the trumpets. And and people shout like crazy. And they go, ah. <laughs> And the city would be theirs. Why do you think God made such a strange plan? Test the faith. Yeah. I then tell so. yeah. yeah. And let them know, this is not you. It's me. I'm going to fight the battles for you. And he's already told them that. He's already told Moses that. When they get ready to go into the land, I will fight your battles for you. All you've got to do is just follow me, and you'll win. And so the first big battle they come to, the Israelites are not to go charge the city and attack the walls and basically assert themselves, God gives them this crazy plan. Walk around the city once, don't make a sound. That had to be tough. Can you imagine thousands of people walking around the city? Don't make any noise. Don't make any voice. Then on the last day, as Teresa said, do it seven times. And at the end of the seventh trip, blow the trumpets, everybody shout, and the city is yours. And so that's what they do. What would have happened if the children of Israel had not walked around the city? They wouldn't have defeated them. They wouldn't have defeated them. Nothing. You know, it's all God's power, but they still had to do something, right? The city would not have been won had they not done what God told them to do. So obviously that's a message for us, right? Even though we're saved by grace through faith, we got to do what God tells us to do. Yeah, be obedient. we got to be obedient. Bible makes that clear over and over. First John says you can't say you love the Lord and not do what he says. Jesus said, why call me Lord and not do what I say? Too many passages in the Bible that tell you and me we're going to have all the faith we want to in Jesus, but if we don't do what he tells us to do, our faith is used in the book of James that we just finished. You know, it makes that pretty clear. Just verbalizing and saying something and acting and not at all it doesn't get you anywhere. So the Israelites, and again, I think this is a great message for us. God could have just destroyed the city like he did Sodom and Gomorrah, right? He could have just called down fire. He could have thrown the water out of the Jordan and wiped it out. But he wanted the children of Israel to do what he wanted them to do so that he could conquer the land. And again, the message is there for us. When you have people tell you, all you got to do is believe. You don't have to do anything. This is not a works-related religion. You need to be able to say it is not a works-related religion, but it is a religion if you have faith, you do the works. The works don't save you. Just like the children of Israel walking around the city did not cause the walls to fall. God caused the walls to fall. But we still have to do what God wants us don't to do. Don't you think some of them felt kind of foolish doing that? Don't you know they did? Which is the next question. Why do you think the people in the city of Jericho thought when they're watching you? Know, like, are you like loony or what? We're not afraid of you. Yeah, you're just walking around the city. What do you think's going to happen? Especially after they've done it the second day and the third day and the fourth day. You know, the people in Jericho, who knows what they were thinking. But if I were them, I'd be thinking, what are these crazy people doing? What? what do they think we're going to be scared because they're walking around the city? Uh, who knows what they're thinking. Uh, but they probably weren't too worried. If that's all you got, all you can do is walk around. You're probably not going to take us. Well, they were protected by the walls. So they thought, Absolutely. They, they, thought they were... In front of them. Yes. Yeah. You can't get to us. So we're going to see some pictures here in a minute of the archaeological dig at Jericho. And you'll see how big these walls were. In some places, they suggest they're at least 40 feet tall. Uh, you're not going to get over a 40 foot tall wall. They don't have any ladders. You know, and, and it's flood season, right? So springtime, crops have been producing. Somebody else, one of the archaeological digs, said there was a natural spring 
right inside the city of Jericho that they still use today. But it would have been right there. And so they didn't have to worry about water. They didn't go to the Jericho River and get water and bring it back. They had a stream inside the city. And the harvest was just producing. And so they had tons of food. The children of Israel would have encamped around that city forever because there wasn't any way to starve them out or thirst them out. And the walls basically were impregnable. That's why that city was there. Nobody could conquer it. So, yeah, I'm thinking they're thinking, oh, you guys are morons. What do you think God commanded to complete annihilation of those living in the area? So they follow their evil ways and check, uh, go after their gods. Absolutely. Their That's gods. Been, they've been warned about that over and over. Even while Moses was still there, they're walking around the desert. God tells them several times, when you get into the land, don't worship false gods. Don't mingle with the people because you'll worship their gods. Uh, be real careful uh, because you're going to be pulled away from me. And if you pull away from me, you're going to pay the consequences. And you're going to have to pay the price. Moses tells them in his last big speech at the end of Deuteronomy, if you do what God tells you to do, he'll bless you. If you don't do what he tells you to do, all the curses that we've talked about that are going to fall on all these Hittite people, they'll fall on you. So they've been warned over and over and over. So God commands complete annihilation. Some people who don't want to believe in the Bible not complete because they have a first time he didn't die. Okay, Paul. <laughs> But a lot of people who don't want to believe the Bible say, what a bloodthirsty, nasty, evil God. You're going to kill all these people. What kind of God is that? Are all those people going to die anyway? You know, sooner or later, right? So it wasn't like God was killing them like they would never die. They were going to die quicker because they didn't obey God. And so as I'm reading that, I'm thinking, could this be a preview of what's going to happen to people in the end who don't accept Jesus? They're going to get complete destruction. They're going to end up paying the price. And people who will say, well, God killed all these people, they weren't going to live forever anyway. They were going to die sooner or later. God may have made them die sooner, but they were still going to die. It wasn't like they were going to live forever. Rahab would have been in that mix if she did not. That's right, correct. And I mean, Paul sitting over here shaking his head. <laughs> Obviously, Rahab and all the people in her home survived. Why didn't she survive? Rahab believed. She believed. She had some faith. She didn't go along with what the people were saying. So the question then is, could the people of Jericho have avoided this destruction? Yes. Absolutely. They could have. If they would have listened to Rahab or just seen it the way she saw it, they might have been able to be saved. And so it wasn't that God automatically was just going to kill everybody. The people who die are the people who don't worship him. And just like Rahab and her family survives, I believe that if everybody had been like Nineveh, when Jonah goes to Nineveh, they all repent. And God doesn't destroy them. I think if the city of Jericho would have come out and said, we've seen what your God has done. Uh, we want to put our trust and faith in him. And we throw away our false gods and we're with you, Yahweh. I don't think they would have been destroyed. But they didn't do that. And so they got destroyed. I think it went the way it had to go. Like, I think part of that is also let up the other tribes see. Well, absolutely. Yeah, this, yeah. Is, this is what could happen. Here's what happens if you don't follow us. Yeah. And we see that happening here before too long. Many of the city states are doing that. They're watching all this stuff happen and they're hearing about it. And they hear about how Jericho is falling. They will hear about how AI is falling. In fact, when they get ready to attack AI, they know that their, their days are over. Except they weren't for an extra day. Um, but yeah, I think people living in the land, if they had turned to God, they could have been saved. They would have not been destroyed because I look at Rahab. So are there other people who are not Israelites who are with the Israelites? Yeah. Who are these people? Pick them up in the desert because they come through marching through. Okay. And who else? Some of the Egyptians. Yes. Sure. Some Egyptians have come out with them. It seems pretty clear when we read the Exodus. It isn't just the children of Abraham that have come out. It's all kinds of people have come out of the land of Egypt. And so, as Paul says, probably while they're wandering around the desert for 40 years, potentially some of those people joined them as well. Uh, we get a passage in chapter 8, verse 33, that says, Citizens and aliens alike, 
together to worship. So the children of Israel have people with them who are not Israelite. They're not out of space aliens. I don't think. <laughs> At least I'm, really sure. Sure. I'm not sure, uh, but I'm willing to make a hypothesis that they're probably not space, not space people. Bob. I know. I, I'm sorry to tell you that. Uh, I'm surprised we haven't seen this verse in some of our shows. Or it's probably been uh, that the aliens were there. But the Bible clearly says it isn't just the Israelites who are worshiping God. They have people who are not Israelites worshiping God as well. And so there's enough evidence to believe that if they would have joined God, they wouldn't have been destroyed. So the message is those who fought against Israel were destroyed because they chose not to accept Yahweh as their God. And that's the message for today. If you reject Yahweh, if you reject his plan of salvation, if you don't put your faith in Jesus, uh, you're going to be destroyed too because you're fighting against God. What else do we read about the Battle of Jericho? Hebrews. Absolutely. Hebrews chapter 11 says this. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell after the people had marched around them for seven days. By faith, the prostitute Rahab, because she welcomed the spies, was not killed with those who were disobedient. So the New Testament writers seem to believe that what happened to Jericho really happened to Jericho. And you'll read people today who don't want the Bible to be what it says it is, and they'll say, well, the Old Testament is just a bunch of myths. It really didn't happen that way. It's just some story about how the Israelites got to be where they were. But well, that's true. who been the Holy Spirit guided the Hebrew writer who was sort of confused as well, because the Hebrew writer says they marched around the city, and Rahab did what she did. You're talking about 1,260 years of time, probably, where Hebrews was written and when they were in there, roughly. Yes, again. What year are we in? Jordan? Oh, no, I'm sorry. Probably 1500, well, 1450, 1450, 1460. Yeah. So that stamp, that time span, they had to be told generation by generation, this is right. what happened. Sure. And, you know. Uh, yeah, it's like Jonah. Jesus references Jonah. So if the Jonah story didn't happen, then why is Jesus talking about it? Why would he say the sign you're going to get is a sign from Jonah? And here's the Hebrew writer saying, here's what happened. So when you talk to people and they want to tell you the Old Testament stories, especially the miraculous kind of stuff, they're just made up. You know, they're just fairy tales that the Jews made up so they can explain what, who they were. Then you've got to be able to say, well, if that's true, then Jesus didn't know what he was talking about. The Hebrew writer didn't know what he was talking about because they referenced the Old Testament facts. And they don't tell them they were just stories. They're referenced as though they really did occur. So you need to know, you need to be able to respond to that should somebody want to tell you all these Old Testament stories aren't really true. Well, then Jesus isn't true. Because he references Jonah. The Hebrew writer references Rahab in the city of Jericho. So don't let people tell you, even people who profess to believe in Jesus, tell you the Old Testament wasn't true. If it wasn't true, then Jesus wasn't who he says he was because he believed it. Bob? Yes. The guy in First Kings that says that he rebuilt Jericho, was it on top of the ruins or was it a whole nother place? I mean, do they have any idea what what that... Top of the ruins, probably. Because the city of Jericho was built up several layers. Just right. like almost every city that, you, that they dig into over there. Cities are built on top of other cities, and they'll dig down, and we'll see here in a minute some pictures of the trenches they dig to see how far down. Y'all probably seen some of this stuff. Where they go down and they see the strata. Here's the 1800 building, here's the 1400 building, here's the 12 BC building. So most of them are just built on top of each other because the sites are strategic. Jericho, as you'll see here in a minute, it's built up on a hill, built up on a mountain. You don't want to build a huge city in a valley. Where the enemies can get up on the mountaintops and throw rocks and stuff at you. You get the highest spots you can get on, and that's where you stay because the enemy can't get to you. But yeah, most of them, they're built just right on top of each other. Okay. Questions about any of this so far? All right, here's some pictures. Again, I'm sorry if you can't see them well. This is a current modern picture of the city of Jericho excavation. This is the mound. 
that the city is built upon. You can see there's a modern day road with vehicles and stuff traveling right by it. You guys been to Jericho? Did y'all go to Jericho while you were there? But we've seen that kind of thing, but I don't think we saw Jericho. Well, that's pretty much if you looked at me, the expert house, right? <laughs> But this is it, and the digging, you can see these trenches. This one's a trench. Uh, up over here, there's a trench. And they just d take a trench, and they just dig straight down, trying to go through the strata, trying to find what's in there. Uh, pottery pieces, all kinds of stuff. Jericho, mm -hmm. however, is dug out, and even though this picture doesn't show it well, and you'll see it better in some of the pictures here in a minute. There's actually little houses and stuff built in through their old things that have been uncovered and that are still uh, in existence today because the city just collapses on itself. And we'll look at that here in just a second. Um, this is the wall outside of Jericho. And you'll notice there's a guy standing over here on the far right side and some rocks. Um, there's some people up here on the top. This is more of the diggings where they've actually excavated the city, walls, buildings, that kind of stuff. So they've, they've done a lot of excavation here in Jericho because it's obviously an important city biblically, not in the sense that it's biblical for God. It's biblical because it either happened or it didn't. And if it didn't happen, then the rest of the Bible doesn't make any sense either. If Jericho didn't get conquered the way it says it did in Joshua, then it's, you can't believe anything that's in the Bible. So the first people who started digging in here were not Bible believers. Many archaeologists are not. Many of them dig to disprove the Bible. And so some of the first ones who got in there and started digging said that there's no way this happened the way the Bible says it did. Because there's absolutely no evidence that the city of Jericho was in existence at either 1400 when we think the Exodus is over here, or 1200 for people who think the Exodus comes 200 years later. According to them, there was no city here then, that it was destroyed somewhere around 1550. And so by the time the Israelites get here, according to Joshua, there wasn't any walled city there, so it couldn't happen that way. Later studies and later excavations have found pottery shards, signet rings, other stuff that dates it pretty much to 30 years either side of about 1400, which is exactly when Joshua would have been there about 1400 B.C. So they're digging all this stuff up. A whole lot of stuff are there for us. Let me read you something. And hopefully it won't bore you to death. This is a guy standing down in one of the pits up against the wall. Those are blocks of what they believe were part of the wall that was there when Joshua showed up, which is going to be interesting because we all think the walls fall down, right? So how come there's many walls? Because that's where Rahab was. Where Rahab was. <laughs> that, well, this could have been that. We'll talk about her in just a minute. But they dig around the city of Jericho, and this wall is there around almost the whole city. And you're thinking, well, that can't be, because we all know the walls came tumbling down, right? Well, we're talking about that here. Just listen to this. The mound, or tell, and that's what they call archaeology. Archaeological sites, or T-E-L-L, -L, or tells, basically it means a mound, and that's where they look for these things because they've been covered with dirt. Was surrounded by a great earthen rampart or embankment with a stone retaining wall at its base. The retaining wall was some 12 to 15 feet high. That's what this guy is standing in. On top of that was a mud brick wall, six foot thick, and about 20 to 26 feet high. So we're getting way up there. We've got a huge wall. We've got a stone base. And then above that, mud brick, like they're building during Egypt and stuff. Remember, that's what the Israelites were doing, making bricks out of mud? Well, that's the west, rest of the wall on Jericho was mud brick blocks. They did that, presumably, according to historians. You put the stone at the bottom so people can't just come dig through it. If it was all mud block, all you need is get something wet and just start chopping through it and be true. So they built the bottom wall with bricks. And then the higher wall is mud brick because you can't get close enough to dig. And so they figured they were safe water. At the crest of the embankment was a similar mud brick wall whose base was about 46 feet above the ground level outside the retaining wall. 
This is what loomed high above the Israelites as they marched around the city each day for seven days. Humanly speaking, it was impossible for the Israelites to penetrate the impregnable bastion of Jericho. And you can imagine, you got a 12-foot high block wall. How do you get over that? How do you get into that? So it says, the citizens of Jericho were well prepared for a siege. A copious spring which provided water for the ancient people as well as modern people uh, lay just inside the city walls. At the time of the attack, the harvest had just been taken in. Remember Joshua talks about the flood season and all that kind of stuff. So the citizens had an abundant supply of food. This has been borne out by many large jars of full grain found in the town homes by this guy named John Garstang, who evacuated or excavated in the 1930s, and also by Dr. Keegan, who comes about 20 years later. With a plentiful supply of food and water, the inhabitants of Jericho could have held out for years. After the seventh trip around the city, on the seventh day, scripture tells us that the wall fell flat. A more accurate rendering of the Hebrew words here would mean it fell beneath itself. And I think I have a slide. Let me find it real quick. Well, let me just show you a couple more. This, this again is more digging. You can see this guy standing there at the top right, bottom right, rather. He's standing by that wall. That's the 12 foot wall that he's standing at the base of. And then the city is built on up above that. And so it's a huge, impregnable city. These are some of the jars of grain that they uncovered in Jericho, buried beneath the city and the walls that had collapsed and the homes that had been burned, are these huge jars full of grain. And the historian, historians are saying, this is pretty good evidence that the siege of Jericho didn't take very long. Because usually you need all that grain. Well, the bad guys were around to you and they're blocking you and you couldn't get food. They'd be eating this, but these jars are full of grain, and the jars are burned. They're scarred with flame, and they dug out some of these houses, and these were down inside these houses. And so they're suggesting, you know, so it goes along with the story that the city fell quickly. People had lots of food. They didn't have to eat it, and so the city falls on them. She says the west side of the wall at the base of the Italian wall, finally says, says she found fallen red bricks piling near, nearly to the top of the revetment. The revetment is the stone blocks. So she says when she dug this stuff out, maybe this is a better rendition. This obviously is a picture. Here's what the Hebrew says that we translate the walls fell down. The Hebrew actually says and she fell the wall under her, and he is going up to people, the city work man in front of him, and they are seizing the city. Makes a whole lot of sense, that's right. That's where the Hebrew reads. In our English it says, and the walls fell down, and they went up into the city. So what they dug, when they dug out and found what they're looking for, what they have found is, this is the mud brick up here. And you'll notice his homes built up against it. That's probably one of Graham's houses, and like Emily said a while ago, after they excavated the whole city, they found an area that had not collapsed. And in that area were rooms, houses, just like Graham's house would not have collapsed. That's an amazing thing to me. But what they suggest happened and what the excavation shows, as they march around the city, the mud bricks collapse, and they fall downward up against the stone bricks, and they built them a map, a ramp. And so with that ramp there, the show of Israel just have to go right up into the sea. They go right over that 12-foot block wall, right up the ramp built by the mud brick walls, and into the sea. And the excavation shows that's exactly what's there. The only argument is, was it 1550 or 1400 with the wind? And again, yeah. later, yeah. Later stuff says it was about 1400 because of the stuff they found digging down through there. But if you look at it that way, it makes the city, it makes the battle pretty cool. You know, the walls didn't just fall flat like the English would say. The walls fell down on top of themselves, meaning those block walls fell down outside the brick walls. And all the Israelites had to do was go right up the many made ramp. You know, if you read stories of sieges of cities and stuff, one of the things they do is bring dirt from places and pile it up against the walls 
so they can go up over the top. They didn't have to do that because the mud brick fell right down where it needed to be. John. Collapse is my translation. Yours says collapse, okay. So that would mean it's straight down. It wouldn't be. Yeah, the blocks fell yes. like, that collapsed right on top of the stone when they just built a nice ramp. Mm -hmm. Right up into it, which to me is just amazing. And some translations actually say the people, the Israelites, didn't went up into the city, which is exactly what you do if you're climbing that ramp. You're going up into the city and going up that ramp. So I thought that was sort of an interesting thing to see the way the archaeologists have discovered Jericho and the way that the Hebrew actually reads. It's in Jerusalem. Stones laying at the bottom of the bed. Yes. Yeah. Or they pushed him over. That's right. Fought, knocked him over. Yeah. Questions about any of that? Observations? Thoughts? You know, we, we saw some ruins. And we could have been in Jericho. I know we were in Dan, which is about the foot of the field. Okay, uh, yes. Um, we were in that area and saw it. From this time span or is ancient Israel? No, yeah. 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 We're from Jerusalem up to the so yeah. Right. And Jericho was just right slightly above the Jerusalem is probably solid. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's off to the left, right above Jerusalem. Uh, you might have traveled that road that's yeah. alongside yeah. the street. Yeah. Right. That may have been where you were. Be. Any other thoughts about any of that? He goes on to say the Israelites burned the whole city and everything in it, as we read the book of Joshua, chapter 6. And once again, the discoveries of the archaeology have verified the truth of the record. A portion of the city destroyed by the Israelites were excavated on the east side. Wherever they reached a level found, there was a burned ash and debris about three foot thick. One of the archaeologists said the destruction was complete. Walls and floors were blackened or reddened by fire. Every room was filled with fallen brick and timbers and household utensils. In most rooms, the fallen debris was heavily burnt, but the collapse of the walls of the eastern rooms seems to have taken place before they were affected by the fire, which is exactly what would have happened. They didn't burn the city until after the walls collapsed, and they got into the city and killed everybody, and then they set it to fire. It goes on to talk about the jars of grain, how they found all the jars. It shows that picture already. Again, the jars were charred as though they had been burnt, but the stuff was all there just like it was supposed to be, showing that the siege didn't last very long, so the people didn't have to eat very much. All right? That's Jericho. That's how the battle's taken. They go in, kill everybody that Ray had in her family, put the city to the sword, and off they go. Let's go a map, and again, I wish you so I could make them bigger for you so you can see them better. It is basically the conquest of the land. And the green arrow is over here. The children of Israel are still with Moses. He's coming up on the eastern side. They conquer some people here. And then they cap out. And then the yellow lines go across. That's where they go across the Jordan to Jericho. And then they come down south. We'll talk about that here in a minute. Come down south and conquer. And then they go up and conquer. And then they're also conquering up in this area on the west side, no, east side of the Jordan River as well. So they still have to beat those guys. But the way they do it, if you read Joshua, they take the center, which is Ai and Jericho and some of those areas. Then they turn south, conquer the southern area. Then they go north and conquer the northern area, doing it that way. That's what happens to them. So the question would be, what happens in chapter 7? First thing, though, notice what happens first. When you read chapter 7, there isn't any indication that Joshua ever goes to God to say, should we go conquer this city? Yeah. How should we conquer this city? He just takes advice of some of the men and they say, this is nothing. This town doesn't hold the cattle to Jericho. Look what we did to them. So let's go. And off they go. Uh, 
without ever once apparently asking God if we should be going. Um, message there for us? Yeah. Pray more. Yeah. We need to pray more. We need to be asking God's guidance and stuff. Then the next question y'all already answered, this is what most of us remember. They lose at AI because Aiken's taken some of the treasures and buried it underneath his tent. He's coveted some stuff. Somebody's coat, some silver, some gold. And the God had said, none of this stuff is yours. You don't get any of the plunder. All of it's mine. Whatever you take goes to me. And what they're going to do with it after that, I don't know. But God said, this is my stuff. You take it all, but you keep it for me. But AI, or Aiken rather, found some stuff and he wanted it. And he coveted the stuff, it says. And he took the stuff. Colossians 3.5 says this, that covetousness is idolatry. Why do you think that's true? Oh, I really, 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 really want that. You're just doing whatever you can to get it. And what are you going to do about God's will? No, careful. Yeah, pay attention to that. So I think that's why Paul says covetousness is similar to idolatry. You're willing to just evade whatever the rules are because you want something bad enough. You put it before everything else. You put it before everything else. God's no longer first. Uh, I'm, I don't care what God says. And God said, you don't take anything. He coveted it and took it anyway. So he's not putting God first. Uh, and anytime you put something before God, in a sense, you're committing adultery. Because God says you'll have no other gods before him. So whether it's stuff, or whether it's some other gods you're worshiping, whatever it is, the point is, we need to just put God first and do what God says. And if we'll do that, we'll be a whole lot better off. Questions about any of that? AI, one, two chapters really, chapter 7 and 8, they go up the first one and lose. Then that Joshua comes back and says, uh, God, what happened here? Why did this happen to us? What's going on? Because the people in AI are... Jumping up and down. They're excited. They beat the bad guys. And so God, can you imagine? Put yourself in Aiken's spot for just a minute. Remember how God picked the person out? They went to tribe. Yes. Can you imagine? You're in whatever tribe Aiken's in. I don't know what it was. But first he calls tribe of Judah. And the whole tribe of Judah comes and walks by. And God said, nah, it's not you. Tribe of Benjamin. No, it's not you. Finally get down to whatever tribe it is that Aiken's in. Okay, that's the tribe. Stop right here. And then they go by clan or by family. So they call out Joseph's family. Now nah, you're okay. Call out Samuel's family. Now nah, you're okay. And here's Aiken sitting back here. He knows exactly what he's done. Can you imagine what he's thinking? Well, all these people are being passed by and slowly we're whittling down closer and closer to his tribe. And finally they get to his clan and then they start going by families and they get to him and they say, uh, what'd you do? And he says, I confess, I did it. Took some stuff. Sorry, it's buried in my tent. What do you think he thought then? Felt like a dog. Probably felt like a dog. What else do you think he might have thought? I'm the guy. Maybe not at first. Maybe it's Okay, I'm confessing. Right. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have done it. Stuff's in my tent. Just go pick it up and give it to God. I mean, that's that's the first thought I'm thinking. He's thinking, okay, I got caught. Maybe I can get out of this if I just tell him where it's at and give it back. Uh, Dead work. And so they take him, all of his family, and the Bible says all of his livestock and everything, every living thing, they took outside the city, stoned them to death. You've been hit by a rock. Can you imagine how bad that has to feel? I'm going to hope a big one hits me in the head first, and that's the end of it. But they stoned them all to death, then they burned them. So is there a message there for us? That's certainly one message. Do what God says or else. What else? Do not put anything before God. Don't put anything before God. What else? Notice his family dies too. Consequences. That there are consequences to your sin that sometimes impact somebody else. You may think, that's ah, just me. You know, nobody else needs to know. Nobody else didn't hurt. And I'm guessing when Aiken did what he did, 
He wasn't thinking for a minute, I'm putting my wife and kids in harm's way. He's just thinking, I'm just going to take some stuff nobody's ever going to know. But when he watches him and his whole family get carried outside in the camp, and you can imagine if he didn't die real quick, he's watching his children, his wife, and everybody get stoned to death because of what he did. You know, there are consequences for things that we do, even when we think we're going to get away with it. It is conceivable they knew it as well, and so they might have been complicit in the crime. That's very possible. I suppose I like that answer better than God killed them all. They haven't done anything wrong. But they all died because Achan couldn't keep his greedy little mitts off the stuff. John. It also says it's cattle, it's donkeys, and sheep. Yeah, everything. 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 So everything. it didn't it was, yeah. it to him. Yeah. It was, it was, Burned it up. Yeah. Burned it up. But I think he does that. I think these are really harsh things that we think of, but they really are like, hey, look at this. Don't do this. Yes. Like it's to make people's eyes like wide open. Absolutely. These people have walked in the desert for 40 years, disobeying God, doing what they wanted to do. Everybody 20 years of age or an older, except for the two, don't even get to go into the city because of their sin. But they weren't following God all the time either. They were still messing up, still doing what they wanted. And I think this instance to me is a lot like Ananias and Sapphira. What happened to them? They died. They died. Why did they die? Why did they die? They lied. They lied. Oh, yeah, they, they lied. About what they sold their, their property for. Yeah. And so here we are moving into the land of Canaan. God's going to help them conquer the land. A very new nation moving into a very new place. God wanted to make a point. You screw with me. Uh, there are consequences for this. He does the same thing with the early church. The people are selling what they have. They're supporting one another. Here comes Ananias and Sapphira. Sell this land, like you say, for $10,000. They bring up 7000 and say, oh, yeah, that's what we sold it for. They both get out dead. And I think part of that, because the scripture never says in fear of getting upon the church. I would think so. But God was making it clear, just like here. we got a job to do. And if you're going to mess with it, there are punishments for this. And I want to impress upon everybody else. Do what you're supposed to do. Don't come at me with a lark. Don't think this is a game. Don't think you can do whatever you want to do and still satisfy me. And again, he does the same thing with Ananias and Sapphira with the early church. He wanted the church to understand. You want to lie to the Holy Spirit, you're going to risk your life. Because he is not somebody to be trifled with. He's serious about what you're doing. Most of us here are very thankful God didn't still do that. Right? Because we probably wouldn't be having Bible class. It's like it really <coughs> has to match the sin. That's right. It has to be equal. Yes, and I think he just wanted to be so sure that the people got the message. We look at it and think, well, it's pretty harsh. Well, you shouldn't have done what you did. You should have honored God's will, and you'd have been all right. Then you can look at where we're at today, and you'll see that obviously we've gotten away from the punishment of God because we don't care. Yeah. Yeah, we don't care. They said they piled stones up there where they, you know, they, where they burned them and so yes. on, and they said the stones are still there. Yep, whoever, whenever they wrote the book, those stones were there so you could go see them. Just like the ones at the edge of the, Jer of the Jordan River. When the kids say, what are these stones? Because God got us across the river. Same thing here. What are those stones doing there? God punished those people for lying to it's a message to you. Can you imagine how many parents took their kids out to that house? <laughs> and said, you better mind me because look what happened to these guys. You know, what a lesson. What a, a neat message for the children of Israel. Little children of Israel. So they, the next chapter, well, the next chapter they did their plan and they conquered the city, right? The, the plan is go in for the few soldiers. When you attack the city, turn it around. AI will chase you. And they hit a bunch of people up in the back of the city, go into the city, burn it to the ground. And when the bad guys are chasing the other guys, they turn and see the city burning. Then the Israelites turn on them and they're caught in the middle and they all die. Um, and then the next chapter, which is one that's sort of a cool little chapter, is a chapter that involves this town of Gibeon, which is right there at the end of that green sign. What happens to the people of Gibeon? They save themselves. <laughs> How do they do that, Scott? Well, they scam the Israelites. They certainly do. <laughs> I do too. Put on a bunch of cruddy clothes and moldy bread and say, ah, yeah, we're, we're from 
way over there. You know, it's a neat little long distance. Yeah. 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 Five minutes away. If you ever read chapter 10, you know, chapter, it's actually chapter 9. Read chapter 9, because Scott's absolutely right. These guys, somebody in that town was pretty smart. They're just right across the road, basically. They're not very far away at all. So they put on old clothes, they put on sandals that are worn out, they get moldy bread, uh, their wine sacks are cracked and leaking, their animals are tired as can be, and they show up and say, hey, we're, we're from way over yonder somewhere. Make a deal with us. And they do. What's wrong with that picture? They lie. Well, Dibian not lied, but what's wrong with the Israelites? God told them to take out everybody. And? Well, they're not living. They didn't go to him. They didn't go to him at all. It's yeah. just like the first attack on Ai. Yeah. Nobody asked God. Nobody says, hey, God, should we make a deal with these Gibeons or not? And they just do. It seems like a smart thing to do because these guys have come from so far away they could possibly be our enemies. Yeah. I'm thinking, well, then how do they hear about all this stuff if they're so far away? They didn't write in the telegraph. You know, how did you get the message? Uh, but that doesn't seem to bother them any. They fall for the old clothes and the moldy bread and stuff. So they make a deal and say, all right, we won't kill you. And then, of course, they soon find out that they're just right over the hill here. And then they asked them, why did you do that to us? And their answer was, well, because we thought you'd kill us if we didn't. We've seen what you've done. Uh, we don't want to die. And so the children of Israel go over like they're going to kill them all. And Joshua, to his credit, said, no, no, you can't do it. You can't kill them because we've already made a deal. Um, so they turned to would have made that deal known and void. Say again? <clears throat> their lying would have made that deal known and void to me. It could have, but they honored their oath. They made a deal with them, we won't kill them. So they don't kill them. What do they do instead? Make them wood cutters and water carriers. Make sure they make them slaves, yeah. We won't kill you, but you'll wait on Sounds like real bummer, but they were alive. Yeah, at least they were alive. They weren't put to the sword. Next chapter, chapter 10, these cities down to the south a little bit, Jerusalem and those other four, they hear about what's going on, and they're mad at Gibeon. They're not mad at the Israelites. They get together and say, we're going to make these Gibeonites pay because they were smarter than us. You know, because Israelites are going to fall for this trick again. And maybe some of them were thinking, we're going to try this. But Gibeon beat them to the punch. So they get an army together, and they're going to go fight the Gibeonites and destroy them for hoodwinking the Israelites. And they call for Israel and say, hey, you need to save us. And I'm thinking, well, that wasn't, that wasn't part of the deal. But they do anyway. And so they fight these five kings, and chapter 10 talks about that. The kings hide in the cave, and they barricade the cave until the fight's over. And then they come open up the cave and hang these guys and do all kinds of nasty things to them. Yeah. But that basically conquers <coughs> the southern part of the land they're trying to take. After they beat those five guys, they come south a little farther, conquer some more of those cities, this is the end of chapter 10. Taking all these battles, something really cool happens in chapter 10. What is it? The sun stops. Sun stops moving. Oh, yeah. The sun stands still. Does that make any sense? How does that happen? I mean, how can the sun stand still? What happens to the rest of the universe? God put his finger on there and said, stop. Well, God created all of it, so he can kind of do what he wants. That's the answer, isn't it? You know, the people who disbelieve the Bible, even some people who believe the Bible, there's no way in the world the sun stopped. I mean, how is this even possible? How can the sun stop moving? First, we know the sun isn't moving technically. We're oh, we were right. Right. But the sun is moving because it's in this big constellation universe. Uh, and so the people who disbelieve say there's just no way in the world this could have happened the way the Bible said. This has to be a made-up story. But I believe it happened. And here's a couple of things that I ran across while I was researching this. It says various North American Indian tribes have tales of a long night passed on by several Indian tribes that talk about a long night that happened thousands of years ago. A long night. Because right there on the other side of the earth, they would have had a long night if Joshua was having a long day. And so there are stories in the Americas about this place that takes late, so that the night just keeps on going. 
the Guatemalan Indians, as well as some in Peru, have a story about a long night. And they would have been existing, these people like say, about the same time Joshua was battling in Canaan. The Greek historian Herodotus, who's written all kinds of a very famous fellow, wrote that when he visited Egypt, the priest there showed him an ancient manuscript that told the story of a day which lasted about twice as long as a normal day. In other words, it isn't just the Bible that says this happened. There are non-biblical writings of other nations that relate this kind of a thing. So there's also a Chinese account from an ancient manuscript that recounted a period of time during the reign of Emperor Yao, which would have been concurrent with Joshua's account, when the sun stood still for several days, this one says. They said that's probably an overestimate. But the idea was the sun stopped. And again, non-biblical, those Chinese would have never heard of Moses, never heard of the Jews, wouldn't have had a clue what's going on over here in Israel. But they've got a story about a long day. So when you talk to people who say, there's no way this could happen, this is just a Bible story, you at least can say, well, that's not really true. There are ancient civilizations from long ago who have recorded history of, in the Americas, a long night that would have concurred about the same time Joshua was having a long day. So I, I thought that was really cool. But the answer really is what you just said. God can do whatever he wants to do. And if God created this universe and put all the stars out there, he can, with the word, say, stop! And everything stops without total destruction. You know, planets don't run out of their orbit. None of that stuff happens. It's called God saying, we're just going to pause here for a minute. So Joshua and the Israelites can wipe the bad guys out. And they pursued them all day, and they wiped them out, and that's the end of that. So an interesting, to me, story. But then after they beat those five kings, Again, they go south at the end of chapter 10 of Joshua, conquer a bunch of other city-states. And most of these things, they're city-states. These aren't nations they're conquering. They're independent cities. And it's almost like our states would have been, you know, you conquer Alabama, they didn't conquer Georgia, they didn't conquer Tennessee, because each of these states are a nation unto themselves. They're not all in one big country. They're all independent little cities or big cities. So I assume as they're going, they're leaving people in these places? It doesn't say that. It just says they're going through a life of mountain. Now, it does say later on, when Joshua starts dividing the land, so they go they they off by all these cities okay. because the cities are empty. So we, we have to assume that until they divide it, they're, they're all grouped up in one group. I think so. And so they're just going through. conquering. They're going through like a bulldozer. So they're pretty much just, it's empty when they leave. I think so. Everybody's dead. That's the way it seems to be, because it says later they go back and go over and get some of these cities, they go inhabit them. Yeah. So yeah, I think so. They're killing everybody and moving on. Until they get done with the northern kings. And then That's they right, until they get up, which is, we'll do, we'll do that two weeks from tonight. Next week's potluck. So we'll pick up with chapter 11 <laughs> next time. We'll end with this one. How was Joshua able to defeat so many enemies so quickly? God on their side. Yeah, that's it. All these kings and their lands Joshua conquered in one campaign because our Lord, the God of Israel, fought for Israel. That's the answer. They did it. They didn't do it. God did it. And he just led the way and conquered these nations because the Israelites at this moment are doing what they're supposed to be doing. Well, no, by the time we get to the end of the book, they don't drive everybody out, so some get left. But right now, they're doing what they're supposed to do. They're following through, they're killing everybody, they're whipping up city after city after city because God is fighting for them because they're doing it the way they're supposed to do it. They're being because obedient. Because if you think how many people will be killed in the battles normally, and you know, he had many battles here, he and did. yet he still got on that. When they had the study, they had 30,000 people. We went to Jericho. I don't know how many people they had now. But you know, if you start losing, you're going to lose some people. Here's a thought. What if they didn't lose anybody? What if no Israelite died? Because there's no indication they did. The only place we read where any Israelites died was when they went up against Ai and lost. 36 people died. That's not very many when you think about thousands in these, this armed conflict. 36 doesn't seem like much. So 36 died then. But there's no indication as they continue on that anybody dies. And if God's fighting
fighting your battle for you. Why would you? You're killing the enemies. They can't land a blow. The arrows don't hit you. Because God's protecting you, and you're just walking through. Because if it's a battle of attrition, somewhere along the way, they're not even having the soldiers left. Because they're fighting a bunch of people. But if God's leading the way and he's fighting for you, you're not dying. None of your soldiers die on the battlefield. Can you imagine how cool that would be? You go to attack something and none of your soldiers die because God fought for them. And they can't beat him. So do you think, so once they conquer something, then they moved off to the next war? Did they leave anything? In the cities they conquered? Yes. Well, that, you know, that was God's question. I don't think so. I think they wiped out the city and went to the next one. So looking at this little map thing here, once they conquered Libna, they went down to Lachish. I don't think they left anybody in Libna. I think they just wiped out the city and everybody packed up and down we went to Lachish. Killed everybody and kept on moving. And make, part of me says a little crudely, I suppose, maybe they did all that because the vultures and wild animals stuff needed some time to hold all the dead bodies. I don't know what they did with all the dead bodies. There's no indication they buried them. That's a good point. Yeah, you know. and they're not burning these cities like they did Jericho. They don't burn these. They're still in existence because the Israelites take them over when they're all done fighting. So somebody has to get rid of all these dead bodies. So what is the timeline from Jericho to the end of the northern? Roughly 30 years. Wow. Not all that much time, really. Yeah. So are they just killing the animals in those places? They were just the people. I think it says they kill everything breathing. Everything that's alive. But you would think with their army that if they at least kept the animals, they would have food. You would have thought so. And again, I'm just pulling out of my head, but I know in Jericho they killed yeah. everything. But in AI, they were allowed to take the loot. So they didn't kill all the animals they, and stuff in AI. They've been rambling in the desert for 40 years. Yeah. they got a pretty good handle on how to survive without other with, people. With no. Next to nothing. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. And they've got tons. So remember, this is the hardest season. Right. And so even though they didn't take anything out of Jericho, all these other cities are going to be just as well fortified, just as well supplied with food. And they're getting to take all this. They're plundering these cities once they get out of Jericho because they got to plunder AI. They got to take all the stuff. And when we finally get to the end and the people go back across the river, those people, they're told, take your booty back and divide it amongst the families. You know, your family that's back over there, don't just hog it all take it back across the river and divide it. So they may not have killed the animal. I'd have to look at that and say, I think it's, uh, it's the same pattern that, like all patterns in the Bible, the firstborn is whose? Yeah. It's God's. Yeah. Okay. okay. So the first battle sure. is well, who? Jericho with all the God. He killed so everybody. Everything belongs yeah. to God in that first battle. You know, then after that, coming. the second, third battle, okay, yeah. you guys do what you got to do. You can keep it. But that's, that first, that's the impression I get. Certainly the, the wealth, the gold, the silver, that kind of stuff. I'm just not sure about the animals. Yeah. I'd have to go back and look. It seems like it would be a way. But it makes sense. Why would they? We're taking that stuff now. We're, we're yeah. just collecting all the, the bounty. Yeah. The yeah. We want all that. But, but the first has to go to God. Yeah. yeah. God and I think that's up. why... You know, because you look through the Bible, that's throughout the Bible the every verse. He always gets the first. Gets the first. Yeah. You're thinking nothing else would be tired. But you would think. Track turn all the distance. You would think. Walking, so. and, and there are a couple of passages in here that says, and they rested. So apparently they didn't just force march 24-7 for 30 straight days or 30 straight years. They would fight, rest, fight, rest. Because I think you're right. The people would get tired. Even if God's doing the fighting for them. A lot of walking, a lot of desert, a lot of hills. You're carrying armor, you're carrying a shield and a sword and a spear, food and whatever else you're carrying. That'd be a lot of walking, a lot of heavy duty stress. But I think they probably wiped the cities out and kept on moving. And once all the fighting was done, then they divided the land and they got the cities. Well, they carried the Ark of the Covenant too. It's there somewhere. Yeah, it's leading the way. Well, the battles are probably more than one day. They're so probably, probably so there's a long amount of time. I'd say they didn't just go in and one day and wipe everybody out. It probably took days. Again, it depends on how God's fighting for them. You know, Jericho took a couple hours once the city yeah. fell. Once the days. walls collapsed. There was, the battle itself didn't take very long. The marching did. But the battle, they just went in and killed everybody. I didn't say it. You know, it took them more than a day. They just went in and did it. But I don't know. Because 
depends on God's fighting for them. If he's doing it, he can kill them anyway he wants to. And especially if your army's not being killed, you're just marching on hands. You know, just like the Roman legions with your shields linked and you're just walking all over everybody. Had to be something to see. And you expect these towns at the bottom after they had all the people run down here and say, let me tell you what happened here. They got to be scared to death. Boy, they roughed up those five kings. They really did. They, <laughs> they didn't do very nice to them. But that's the end of the southern battles here at the end of chapter 10. And then we'll go north two weeks from tonight and move on through the book. Like I say, the rest of the chapters don't have a whole lot of stuff in them until we get to the last couple of chapters and we hear about Joshua and the promise and the people's pledge and all that kind of stuff. So we'll go ahead and read the rest of the book for the next over the next two weeks. Be ready for that. And that's what you'll pick up then. Questions? Thoughts? Bring food next week. That's great. John, you want to dismiss us? Oh. All right, John, thank you today. Thank you for everything you do for us. Thank you for these lessons we've studied tonight through Joshua to just trust you and obey you in everything we do to seek out your wisdom in our daily lives. We thank you for Bob's knowledge and the uh, the proof of men that's been proven through the fall of Jericho so we can have evidence to prove that your word is true. We give you all the praise. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Thanks, John. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Bob, have you ever... Uh,